Okay, so this is my review of Lovecraft Country Episode 2, Whitey's on the Moon. This episode was directed by Daniel Sackheim and was written by Misha Green. Daniel Sackheim is a huge TV vet in directing and producing. You've seen his work in The Leftovers and Game of Thrones, True Detective, Better Call Saul. He's got a great track record and it was exciting to see him directing an episode of this show. And it's interesting because Misha Green's more of a new name in this scene and being the showrunner of Lovecraft Country, it's awesome to see her writing so far the first two episodes. So knowing this show is executive produced by J.J. Abrams and Jordan Peele, you see that this episode really leans more into that Jordan Peele-esque vibe to it. And what's interesting is if you listen to any of the Jordan Peele commentaries, particularly the one on Get Out, he talks about how obsessed he is with his whole universe. He's kind of creating his head about stories and secret societies, and you see that later in the movie Us. So it makes total sense that he'd be attracted to a story like this in Lovecraft Country, and it really going now into the culty side and secret society side in this episode. So this episode actually starts out with a lot of exposition. It comes from the character of William. This guy clearly isn't a normal human. There's something up with him, but he explains to our three main players here that the original founder of the lodge is Titus Braithwaite. And he's a cousin to who we'll meet later on, Samuel Braithwaite. And his daughter is Christina Braithwaite, who we'll also get more into. And they build a lot of themes early on here, in particular, this theme about how it ended with Titus by him causing the original lodge to go on fire and killing everyone except one of the slaves who we'll find out is related to Tick and this will connect why his father Montrose went there for the birthright reason and knowing that they have blood there and then him being the bait to get Tick to the house. So unlike episode one which is a little more action-packed and it's just kind of more of a straightforward journey Episode two, you really got to pay attention. They're throwing a lot of information at you. So it can get a little confusing if you're not maybe rewinding a couple lines here and there. So as the episode goes on, we learn that Letty and George, the reason they've forgotten about the monsters the night before is they've had a spell put on them and that spell is put on them to forget about the monsters, but they are real. And you see this whistle is what gets the monsters away, leading us to see Christina again, the woman who we saw save them with the car last episode. And we'll learn a lot about Christina here and that she's actually a witch, which was really pretty cool. And I didn't even realize it'd be witches in this show. So what's exciting about Lovecraft Country is they're kind of throwing you a lot of surprises and really no rules to it as we go on. So it, it, it's interesting in the sense of a type of show, you just never know what you're gonna get. So what works really well here is George, he actually takes a book off the bookshelf that opens a secret door, but the importance of this is the book he actually finds. Titled The House on the Borderland, it's from 1908. It basically is the basis of this whole episode. And you'll see George later on when he's talking to his long lost love, he's hallucinating. He explains that story to her, which matches the plot of this episode. And what's interesting about that story is it was also a big inspiration for H.P. Lovecraft and his work. He's been quoted in saying that. So it again, connects to the Lovecraft theme of this all. And the attention to detail this show brings is really phenomenal, especially in just two episodes. And it continues here when then George finds another book titled Order of the Ancient Dawn, which is inspired by a real book, Order of the Golden Dawn, which was a secret society in the early centuries committed to studying and practicing paranormal activities. So already from that book title, you're getting an idea of what we're getting into with the society we're meeting in this episode. So we'll see when Tick is brought into the lab here by Christina to meet her father, Samuel. Samuel is obsessed with the character of Adam from the Bible and believes he is the Adam in his story. And he's literally sacrificing his rib here that he'll eventually want to feed to the other lodge members later in the episode. And you learn more about Christina here in her reactions to her father because her father quotes the Bible. It explains his motivations. He wants to have immortality here, go back to the paradise times before it was messed up and how she makes a joke, how a woman and Eve messed everything up. She basically hits at that biblical literalism is for the simple minded. So you see that Christina is this complicated character. You don't know really where she falls yet. And it was good casting to have Abby Lee play her because her natural presence on screen, it's kind of alien in a sense, cause he just kind of like, what's the deal with this person? Like there's just like this mysterious just vibe she just naturally gives off. So I really like this montage here where when we see Christina's spells and what she's capable of as a witch that Tick is constantly testing her just to see if he can actually trust her when she says she wants to be his friend. 
and then she takes a spell off George and Letty and then puts him locked in his room with an invisible door. And then we get a really weird scene thrown in where Christina runs outside to a cow that births a little baby monster. She says it's her first time doing this. I have no idea what this is supposed to mean, but it kind of sets up some odd mystery to look forward to. And why this montage works, that sets up with the spells being removed, but also putting a spell locking them in their rooms, is that it makes this episode pick up the pace and a lot of tension here again. And we see more shining inspired shots. You see that with Letty here trying to open the door to get out. It's the same shot that we see of Jack Torrance in The Shining trying to get out of that freezer room. And we'll see she meets the demon version of Tick. It's not actually Tick. And this scene is beautifully set up by the painting that they look at where it's a painting of a man with a snake penis about to have sex with a woman, which is literally showing you what's going to happen in this situation later on. But while we're seeing this hint of what's going to happen in the picture, we're learning about the character of Lita. And this is some really top-notch writing and it's giving you so much information on one layer with the dialogue and the other visually. And we're learning that her mother abandoned her at an early age, that there is something subconscious in her mind that likes Tick and that hopefully Tick could be someone that won't abandon her like the demon Tick is saying. And while we're learning about her, we transition to learn more now about the real Tick who's trapped in his room and he's getting his PTSD showing up now in demon form. And we see this woman from the Korean War here pop up that he clearly dealt with. Now this explains two mysteries from the first episode because he got a call from South Korea hearing a woman and she said you shouldn't have left. We didn't know what that was. That's clearly this woman. And that same woman we see in this scene is the same woman we saw from the opening scene of the show in episode one where the woman's coming down painted in red from another planet and that is this woman he's constantly thinking about that something bad happened with her. And then we see George. He sees his long lost love in Dora. Like I said, the story talks about the book, House on the Borderland, explaining the episode here. And a really good line written here is when Dora asks him, did that story have the lovers stayed together? And he says, yes, because the house collapsed in the end. And that's exactly what happens here. It's tragic and sad and leads to George's death paying off so well because he will die in the end due to the house collapsing. Because if the house didn't collapse, we're to trust, as Christina says, that Sammy would keep his end of the deal and keep George alive. And this will lead to George being reunited with Dora in the afterlife forever. And what's crazy is when we see the snake wiener actually come out here, it then cuts to the whole society here watching them through the walls, which was really cool. So the symbol of the triangle is so important in this episode, and you see it a lot because it's connecting to the all-knowing eye symbol, AKA the eye of providence, which you see on dollar bills, which is connected to Illuminati. And in that triangle, there's that eye and you see the symbolism here of just this secret society being in the middle as the all-knowing eye with the triangle around them of our three main players. You also see in the next scene when they come out of their rooms, they're set in a triangle. And you see that earlier in the episode. You also see that when they see the monsters in the woods, they're always in this triangular position. And as you see these rituals go on, you see the robes they wear have the eye with the triangle around them. You see it on the floor. And in the last scene when Tick is actually in the sacrifice, he has the triangle around him with those like laser beam things. And what adds more to the payoff of George passing and making it really hurt and you feel for Tick losing him is how he's such a comforting ear to Tick when Tick is hard himself about the war and what happened with this girl. And you see that in his scene when he comforts him and Letty. So it, it, you're gonna miss George here as a character, but it makes sense that he went, they were already foreshadowing in episode one that he was gonna have a short life here because he has all these big emotional moments early on. And you need that for Tick and Letty to grow as characters losing kind of what keeps them safe and really gives them a challenge coming up. And now we finally find the father. He was in that stone building guarded by that crazy lady, Dell and the dogs, and he was trying to dig himself out. He comes up and then he joins them, but you see he's already pretty much a prick to tick here by saying, I only asked you to come because I was under duress with that letter. So you see Tick is hurt by that. Montrose is a totally different breed of personality than George. But George, again, having more exposition here, he's telling them in the car when they're trying to escape that there's multiple lodges throughout the country. And this one in particular is called the Sons of Adam. And their goal is to get immortality. And when they connect all these dots, just hit by an invisible wall here, which was pretty crazy. And Christina and Samuel appear. Samuel shoots 
Letty and shoots George. This will lead Tick in this ritual that they need him for in his blood. And we learn here that Samuel believes this ritual will lead him to the Garden of Eden and eternal life. But Tick has an important line. He's like, look, that doesn't that didn't work for Titus. What's the difference here? And that's an important theme here because Samuel thinks he can pull this off and doesn't learn from history in the past. And that goes with that theme in this episode about not learning from our past and repeating the same mistakes. And you see Tick's trying to get at Christina because he's like, your dad doesn't give a crap about you. Why are you helping him? And we learn more about Christina here because Christina says, yes, they've done terrible things, her family and this society, but she still struggles with her dad's approval here, helping them when they need it. And she even admits it's pathetic. And because she calls a family, it makes it seem okay. And you see her jealousy and that anger she has and bitterness where she's just like, a black man in its own right can get a ring and she can't. So she's got this just weird thing going on with her and it's gonna be interesting to see where she kind of falls at the end of the day. But you see Tick notices there's areas to break in Christina. And it really does a good job of explaining why Christina even saved them last episode in the first place and it wasn't all for good. It was just also to accomplish the goal of getting Tick alive safely to her father. So we get more info now into Montrose and George's relationship and what George was talking about in the last episode, how Montrose had the brunt of it from their parents and you see here, they talk about a story where Montrose was beaten silly by his father and George didn't even know this example of it. And just props to Courtney B. Vance here. He does so well across the board in this show and really hits just in his voice how emotional and important moments and lines are he's saying. Especially when he says the line, I've been shutting up far too long, hurting the ones I love, which was set up in the last episode and Tick feeling that way about him and that he kind of turned a blind eye into the way he was raised in the same way he felt about his brother Montrose. And you see, he always had that personality too because in that same scene last episode when Lita and her brother are just in a screaming match in the kitchen, he always takes the angle of like, that's their business. But maybe sometimes you would look at it as turning a blind eye. And then he says this important line to Montrose, he might not be yours, talking about Tick. This sets off Montrose and adds us as the audience to think, what does he mean by that? Who is Tick's real parents? So the most important theme here in this episode that pays off, it's Rooted from the title of the episode, Whitey on the Moon, which is referencing a spoken word poem by Scott Heron from the 70s. This plays over the ceremony happening with Tick. The poem starts with him talking about his sister being bitten by a rat while Neil Armstrong was landing on the moon, leading to him discussing the medical debt that was incurred from this happening to his sister and the rising cost of basic necessities because of the moon landing. And it ends with a sarcastic promise. When the next bills arrive, he would send them an airmail to Whitey on the moon. So clearly this poem is about the space program and the controversy of it and that he put all this money into going and landing on the moon and how that maybe makes some of America happy. But there's a struggling part of America that that upsets them because there's more important things clearly that should be being paid for like these medical costs for the struggling people. It connects to the story in this episode because Samuel himself is kind of taking the place of the space program here, that he's looking for immortality, just like they were looking for this next level of achievement getting to the moon, but while having others suffer for that and someone else paying. And that would be here, Tick. So that brilliantly works. I think it's an awesome connection here. So it was really crazy as we can assume now, Tick is looking through this portal and sees the pregnant Hannah that they talked about running through the woods, running from the original fire with Titus. And now he's in sync running with her again from a fire and going to that theme of this backfiring again and Samuel not learning from the past and repeating it. And we get this big sad moment, Uncle George passing, Jonathan Majors absolutely kills it here when he realizes he's dying. I'm blown away just by Misha Green's writing these first two episodes. It makes me excited because now you're seeing an, a relatively newer writer and it being a really good writer because there's no cracks here in these first two episodes. There's no eye rolling moments and it's consistent and it's layered with themes. It has so much setups that pay off quickly and effectively and it's giving a lot of characters the time they need and the weight to build up into their characters to make you care about them and want to know more about them and blending mystery there. Also adding fun in the action and adventure and the sci-fi aspect to it, the pulpiness of it and feeling unique. I don't think this episode was as 
good as the first episode, but it's still great. I'm gonna give this one a 9.3. I think it definitely had kind of a very heavy exposition beginning and was a little slow, but right when they showed Christine was a witch on, I think it was excellent and just keeps me excited for what's to come. Let me know down below what you thought of this episode. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I read every comment and try to respond as many as I can. Let's get a discussion going about this show, make it the place to be to talk about it. And please make sure to subscribe so you don't miss one of my reviews of Lovecraft Country. I'm also reviewing every episode of The Boys Season 2 at the moment. I also do movie reviews and celebrity interviews so you don't miss any of those. And please follow me at Steve Varley Show on Twitter and Instagram for more of me. And I'll see you next time.